church tonight and I'm excited about what God's going to do. Why don't we stand and go before the Lord in prayer and just go ahead and thank God and just praise Him and worship Him and let the Lord Jesus just resurrect your spirit tonight and praise Him. Give God the glory and the honor and praise. There's freedom in praising God. There's joy in praising God. Oh Lord Jesus, we worship You and we ask touch our lives, uh, to move and meet the needs, to heal, Lord God, to move. Go ahead and praise Him. Go ahead and give Him glory and honor. And let's sing about going to heaven tonight. Brother, if you go. There's a happy land, a promise over in great begun, where the Satan's shoes of earth and glory share. Happy. 
take us home. You say, preacher, this is coming up, that, whatever, whatever. We just came out of a wonderful conference. God is here. And God wants to bless you. Just rejoice. Go ahead and praise him one more time. Jesus, we praise you and worship you and just thank you for the grace and the goodness. Thank you, God, for that special victory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want the ushers to come at this time. All right, let's give to God on a Sunday night. Yeah. Do our part, giving the offering, paying our tithe, supporting the program of God the way we should, and just loving him. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. At this time, Brother Logue, sir, if you'll pray for the offering, gift, and the giver. Amen.
praise his name and give God the glory and thank the Lord God for the precious love that turned us all around. Go ahead and praise him a little bit. Why don't you shake off some of that, that travel weariness and just rejoice and say, you know what, Jesus, you've been good to me. And we are so grateful to be in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Give the Lord a great big round of applause tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Give him a, a joyful noise. And just thank the Lord God that he is good. Jesus, we praise you and worship you. And we're just going to lift up our voice and say, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. And Pastor Keckle's coming to preach to us. God bless. Well, praise the Lord. As Yoga said, it's the Star Wars guy, Yoga. The one with the tight pants and the big ears. So there is no try, only do. So instead of saying, I'm going to try to preach to you, I'm just going to do it. was teaching and preaching last week and so kind of tore up the old voice a little bit and I don't think I really ever lose my voice anymore that's what young novices do so I got to feeling a little bit too young and tore it up but God is good so there's a lot of people still traveling keep them in prayer the break won't be over until what Tuesday night so they'll be back, Lord willing. Amen. So I preached to you tonight. I didn't this morning. Pastor Kinson said, well, sometimes that morning voice is, is a little more messed up than the evening voice. So I don't just do the best I can tonight. When I get 13, my voice will change. Lord's good tonight. Yeah. Ephesians 1. So the Lord gave me a message this morning while Pastor Kinson was preaching, so here it goes. Root, pig, or die, as Pastor used to say. Rain or shine, here it is. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. And to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So before you jump on that word predestination, you should stop and see what we're predestined to. He didn't say you were predestined to be saved or lost. He said that he has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom, who's that? Christ is the beloved. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So we'll preach from Hebrews 12, 2. That's your Bible reading. Text is verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Pastor Kinsley, would you pray? Oh, Lord Jesus, God. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to preach to you on a title. Perfect posture. Perfect posture. That's what your mom wanted when she yelled at you, sit up at the table. Quit slouching. The position is what posture is. It's how you hold your body when you're standing or sitting. Are you slumped over? Are you laid back? Your posture is how you are positioned. It is a particular way of behaving that is intended to convey a false impression, a pose, or like someone they might call a poser, trying to make an impression that is not really the truth. In the late 16th century, this word came forth, and it was about the relative position of one thing to another, how they are postured. But it comes from a Latin root, positura, which means your position, and it's akin to the verb known in the Spanish, ponere, pone, like put on your clothes. Right, Brother Rivera? Pone la ropa, la ropa. Put your clothes on. I'm thankful that everybody here tonight has put most of their clothes on. And it's also the cousin of the word deposit, posit, pose, pone. It means put in, put, put on. So when you put yourself in a certain position, whether sitting uprightly or slumped in a chair, you are putting yourself that way. And all these things that are mentioned in Ephesians are intended to convey positions that are literal and that we understand ourselves to be in if we are in Christ. And he was sharing this morning about the book by the Chinaman, the missionary watchman, Knee, N-E-E. -E. So when you're getting out of the pew there, watch your knee. <laughs> Watchman Nee wrote the book he referred to, Sit, Walk, and Stand. It is a book that we use in Bible school as a Pauline epistles textbook about the epistle of or to the Ephesians, a church at Ephesus. And so... There are three things that he pointed out, and that's why Watchman wrote about it. Sit, walk, stand. Three different postures. Talking about perfect posture. The one that you put yourself in. Because mentally, you put yourself in a certain disposition. You either think of yourself as saved, or you always walk around feeling like you're not saved. You either realize you're a child of God in Christ, or you let the devil talk you out of it and make you think you're a dirt bag. The way you think of yourself and see yourself can be either scriptural or imagination. A lot of different ways, but when you put yourself in these, or one of these postures, really all three, then you're setting yourself up for success. You're setting yourself up for success. By what do, you, what do you mean by that? This has to do, this seated in Christ, first of all, has to do with the final position of conquest. 
It means that the believer sees and understands that he's not only buried with Christ by baptism. And baptism in water signals to everyone, hey, I'm dead. I've been buried with Jesus. I'm in him. I'm dead to my, act, my past sin. I'm dead to sickness. I'm dead to the fall. I am dead to the wrath of God that is coming because in Christ I've been justified by his grace. And so I see what the Bible says about me and think of myself that way and realize, wait a minute, I'm seated with Christ. In the Bible reading, didn't it say something about all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ? Where is Christ tonight? He's up there and he's seated at the right hand of God. So if you and I are in him, then we are seated with him, buried with him, risen with him, ascended with him, seated with him in a position of conquest. And Paul said in the book of Colossians, he said that we are seated with him far above all principality. We're far above all powers that be. We're positioned far above all the things of this world and the darkness of this world. We are in him and we are seated with authority. He died, rose, ascended, and then sat at the right hand of God. Let's look at the Bible as it talks about it. Hebrews 1.13 He asked the question as he was talking about the angels and making the point that the angels are nowhere near as great and powerful as Jesus Christ. He was not just one of the angels. And he was not just a man. He was not just some prophet, as the Mormons say, the Latter-day Saints or whatever they think they are. He was not some kind of long-haired hippie walking around dispensing drive-by wisdom to the masses. He is God. The Bible said God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the apostle wrote and said, We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, a Son of God, full of grace, full of truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he asked the question in this argument here. He said, to which of the angels said he at any time? Let's rephrase that. When did God the Father ever say to one of the angels, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Question mark. He never said that or asked that question to an angel. But he did Jesus. He said that, Lord, sit at my right hand. And until I make your enemies your footstool. And I think if they are the footstool of Christ, then they must be the footstool of us. And what is a footstool? It's somewhere you put your foot. When you're relaxed, you put your foot on a footstool. In other words, it means under me, beneath my feet, in subjection to me, down low. I have dominion over it. God said, sit at my right hand. You have died, risen, and ascended. And now just sit here in the seat, the seat of power, until I bring all your enemies under your feet. If only Christians could realize these enemies are under my feet. We sing the chorus, the devil is under my feet. Then we get up Monday morning and let him slap us down under his feet. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I've heard all kinds of songs throughout the 70s written about Monday. Monday, Monday. Da, da. Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. Well, tomorrow, don't let Monday get you down. Instead of saying, oh, man, I got to go back to work. Say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me a job. Let me go make some money so I can buy some donuts this week. 
Hebrews 2, I'm sorry, 12, 2, said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise the Lord. He didn't like the shame. He didn't love the cross, but that was the will of God to purchase our salvation. But when it was all over, he was thinking about the joy all through the process that was set before him. And when it was all over, after the endurance, after all the shame and the misery that was put upon him, he ascended up on high and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. So in Colossians 2, 8, the apostle Paul wrote, don't let any man spoil you. The spoil is what happens when war would take place and an army was defeated. They would take the spoils of war. They would take their belongings, take their weapons, take their whatever they wanted. That was their reward for defeating the enemy. And he said, don't let a man spoil you. Well, how can a man come and take away what is mine? How can he defeat me and destroy me and take what's rightfully mine? Through philosophy. Confuse us, say. He who walk through house in dark hit face and doorpost and such like. The philosophy of man, we were talking about it today, we were talking about fortune cookies. You notice that fortune cookies have become woke? Now they don't say, you're going to come into a windfall of money not too long from now. Or you're going to meet the person who will be the love of your life very soon. That's what fortune cookies used to say. Now they say, the sky is blue when the clouds have moved back or the wind is blowing sometimes. Some worthless saying that doesn't mean anything. You used to at least get a little philosophy in there, a little Taoism or a saying from Kung Fu or somebody. You did. And some of them are pretty good, you know. They make sense. Don't let some clown come and mess you up with his philosophy and vain deceit, deceiving words. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Why? He said for, that means because. Because in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of God is not in man's philosophy. It is not in education. It is not in any of these things. But it is in Christ. Because in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Didn't say the Father and the Son dwell in him. But it said the fullness of of the Godhead. God, according to the Bible, gave Christ the preeminence. He set him forth to be the object to whom people must look in order to be saved. It is he that is the Savior of the world and no other God. And God gave him the preeminence. God has put all things under his feet so that you could be in him and God could bring all things under your feet so he could get us out of sin, so he could take away the power of sin that held us in bondage, so we could be born again, new creatures, free, liberated, shining lights in a darkened world. And he said, in whom you also are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands. Wow, what is that? That's a circular cut or incision. And you should know what that is, but he's referring to that uh, tradition of the Jews, which God gave them under the Old Testament, as a seal, a bloodshedding seal of their contract between them 
and God. That's what it was for. Think of a blood brother kind of a situation where blood was shed. They did that, but it was typical and emblematic of Christ coming whose blood shed would make and establish a new covenant, the New Testament in his blood, as it is called. He said, when you eat that bread and you drink that wine, it is the New Testament in my blood. When Jesus died, his blood was the seal of his absolute intention of keeping his word. When he died for our sins and all the promises that are in him, he sealed it with his own blood. So he said, we're buried with him by baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him. He's made us alive together with him. He's raised us together with him. And praise God, the good part here is that in the process he forgave us all our trespasses. Amen. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers look at that said don't let men's wisdom men's philosophy men's great intellectualism spoil you because jesus has spoiled the devil and all his power and all his kingdom what do you mean he defeated him by the death burial and resurrection that he did and he conquered him He took back the power that Adam and Eve gave away. How does that translate to me, preacher? Well, it means you are no longer under his power if you are in Christ. Sinners are. They can't break the power of Satan. And religious people, they think that they're saved, but they really aren't. So how can you, how do you know if somebody saved? If you, if you point something out, you're finding fault and you're attacking them. No. Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. Look at what they do. I'm not talking about a mistake they might make, but I'm talking about the evil, the way they live, their habitual sinning, their life that has no place for God in it. That is a testimony that they do not know God. It's just religion. That's the difference between Christianity and religion. And way too much Christianity in the world is just religion. I'm saying, and I know that I am, but nobody else knows. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus defeated the devil, and he sat down at the right hand of God in the place of King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the ruler of all things. After all, the Bible said, he created them, that they were created by him, and they were also created for him. But in the process, church, it wasn't just Jesus creating a bunch of cool stuff like universes and galaxies for himself. Those that are in him are part of him. If you're in the body of Christ, then Jesus said, you're not my servants, You're my friends, and all things that the Father has given me, I give to you. Well, that'd make a dead man shout, but not us. Ephesians 4 brings us to the next way in which we need to posture ourselves. He said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. And Pastor Kinson was teaching or preaching or both this morning about that. And that's where God spoke to my heart about the message. I don't know if it's for tonight or not. It may not be. I'm chopping it all to pieces, but at least I'm preaching. Hallelujah. And 
one that was part of the conference, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But look at this here. He said, all of this three chapters of awesomeness about being in Christ and the blessings and the promises and being part of him and having all of his benefits loaded on us just because we are in him. That's grace and mercy. And there's a way you can explain grace and mercy, which I, if I remember it, I'll try to in a minute. But he said, walk worthy. We may be seated with him. That is positionally where we are in Christ. But there's the behavior and the life that we have to live before him, to walk with him. He said in Genesis 5.22, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He never died. And for you Revelation lovers, he's one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11 who come during the tribulation and minister. Then he dies, and then he's caught up to God right in front of everybody, along with Elijah. They're the only two Old Testament figures who never died a mortal death. And they are prophets. And if you go into other books like Zechariah and so forth, you can figure out that that's who they are. But that's neither here nor there. But the thing is, he walked with God. Can it be done? An Old Testament believer? What did he believe in? Not Christ. He didn't know about Christ except he was some coming Messiah. But he walked by faith. He believed God's words. He's kept himself set aside unto God because that's what God wanted him to do, to be holy because the Lord God is holy. He sanctified himself. He, he didn't break the law that Moses gave to Israel. So it was by faith he was made righteous, but he could not be born again. He could not ascend up on high because Jesus hadn't come yet and the blood had not been shed yet. So it was impossible for him to go to heaven. But these two men, Elijah and Enoch, were translated, the Bible said in Hebrews. God took them. He broke all the standard rules about an Old Testament saint going into heaven. He took them anyway and translated them, and they have not died yet. So they have not been resurrected. So there's these two mortal men translated and standing before the Lord God of all the earth. The Old Testament shows us that they're standing there next to God in his throne room. Wow. That's awesome stuff to me. But I love the Bible. So he said, walk worthy of this calling. How do I walk worthy? First, you can start with lowliness and meekness. Amen. Then a little long-suffering might help. Does God want me to live like that? Yes. He doesn't want me to be a big mouth braggart. Or nobody can get in the word in edgewise because I'm busy talking about myself. No, he does not want you to be that. He wants you to, according to the scripture, be courteous, kind. Get some manners. Just because you're from the northeast or the midwest doesn't mean we get to just say whatever comes into our mind. There's a time to shut up and a time to speak. Didn't Solomon say that? There's a time to speak. And there's a time to refrain from speaking. God help us to know the difference. I was going to preach one time. My wife and I were talking about that plaque we have down in the office that says a prayer. It's an earnest prayer. It said, Lord, put your arm around my shoulder and your hand over my mouth. Isn't that a wonderful prayer? 
Put it in your prayer life. And when he was talking about this this morning, forbearing one another in love, what did you say about it was putting up with? Putting up with people. Right, but you, that's the one you didn't hit, and I was thinking of. You're right. It is putting up with people because of love. But this other one about endurance, that's what it is. So it proves to you, look at that scripture. Would you look at that scripture? <laughs> Think about it. Forbearing one another in love. That is proof that even though you love somebody, Sometimes you have to endure them. Just because you see them coming, you think, good heavens, not now. And you think, oh, Lord, I'm not in the mood to endure that again. Are you really going to do me that way tonight? You know good and well that sometimes... You see them coming, and you take that wide road. Mm -hmm. I'm going around because once you get her started, it's like a lawnmower with no choke on it. It just keeps running and running and running until she runs out of gas. Come on, neighbor. <coughs> Say amen. <laughs> and maybe your mama never taught you. When somebody's talking to someone, you don't walk up and stand there and grin at them. But I want to talk to them. Well, you wait until they're free, and then you'll probably, you don't go walk up there. <laughs> and worse, you don't just come up there and start talking and interrupt people. You never had that? When you interrupt adults and your dad would say, hey, don't interrupt me. It hurt your feelings. Sometimes people need that, maybe. Maybe you could, but you, uh, if you get your feelings hurt, you might quit coming to church. So, not to, yes, brother, we will put everything on hold right here and forget what we were saying to wait and see what it is that you have. They wouldn't like that, would you? None of us would. What if they turned around? What if you, you were talking and your wife butts in? How do you treat her? Shut up, I'm the head of the house. Quit talking. Don't talk when I'm talking. But you go around buttoning in everybody else's conversations, which makes you equally culpable. Just a, just a little hint there. It's just about manners. I don't, don't get upset. Here, I got a book on manners right up here. Rules and civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. That's a good book, isn't it? That's the one that says, written by, was it written by George Washington? Yeah. Rules said not to drum your fingers at the table. Don't pull out your fork and knife and pretend that the plate is a drum set and the glass is a cymbal. Woo! Man, there's some good stuff in here. Well, when you sit down, keep your feet firm and even without putting one on the other or crossing them. Shift not in the sight of others, nor gnaw your nails. Shake not the head, feet, or legs. Roll not the eyes. Lift not one eyebrow higher than the other. Rye not the mouth and bedew no man's face with your spittle by approaching too near when you speak. Oh, praise God. I like that one right there. To, just in the last week, I had to back up from a few people. Said, man, I don't know if that's fromage or feta. What does that mean? Their breath smelled like nasty cheese. But when you're standing there and pieces are flying out and sticking to your forehead and running down into your eyebrow, you know, and you back up, and what do they do? They get closer. You're backing up, and they get closer. They back up, like those monsters in the horror movie, you know, they're, they're getting closer and closer, and the victim's just in, oh, oh, oh. 
Why, why don't they get up and run? The monster can only move at half a mile an hour, and they can't outrun him. And they just sit there and get strangled. And so people, why can't they see, hey, I'm talking to this man, and he's backing up. When somebody takes a step back, it's a signal. It's time to get a mint out. Just saying. You weren't really shouting anyway, so we'll just throw some stuff out there. What does it mean? It means putting up with people because you love them. So he, he said that we should walk with God. Those in the Bible walked with God, which means the same thing as Adam in the Garden of Eden before the fall. He walked in the garden with God every day. God came down and visited with him. Have you visited with the Lord lately? Has he come down and sat there? I know you can't see him, but you can certainly feel him. If you're a Christian, you can feel when he steps into the room. He's within you, and you can feel it all around you. And this kind of communion is what gives us the strength. To, to be a Christian, to love God, to live for God. We need that which comes from him because we know that we ourselves are not able. And that's the difference between grace and works. You see, the world is in an uproar now because it used to be, and I'm going to tell you why, and you're not going to like it, and enemies will try to make more out of it than what it is. But the truth is it, just, it was just an article that came out from the Hillsdale College in Detroit area, Michigan, where many conservative leader, leaders go to college and they train leaders and lots of different people. But they have a very conservative Christian-based approach to education in college. And they sent forth an article that was talking about the colleges of yesteryear and um, the medical profession in particular and how that they would take people, the medical exam in the beginning, and they would take people based upon their ability and their knowledge and their intelligence. And then they found out that some of the minorities weren't, that weren't scoring as high were uh, given... A gratis, in other words, it said, even though there are some people, and that could be also white people, that cannot pass the test, let them in anyway. Because it's no longer knowledge or intellectual based, but it's what you look like. And so they want to let people who can't even pass a test become professionals and you're going to find out that you won't get the same kind of service and ability and all the ability in the professional world because they let them in just because they say well they're not white and therefore they're not privileged so we let them in because of grace whereas it used to be based on ability and so really, ability isn't peculiar to a race. Ability goes along with the person. They either have understanding or they don't. They're either smart enough or they're not. It isn't relative to their race or their origin. It may have something to do with their upbringing, but any person in any upbringing can bring themselves out of it and create their own opportunities. If they don't believe that, then they won't create them, but you can. You can, and there have been people that did it. You may remember Supreme Court Justice, well, what's his name? Thomas. He came out of poverty and lack of education, educated himself, and ascended all the way to the Supreme Court. He didn't let what people said about him stop him, and he still doesn't. I think he's the most awesome one in the Supreme Court. He came up out of adversity and made good because he wanted to. 
Poor people who rise up, they're hardworking, they're poor, never had anything, but because they're hardworking, they surpass those who seem to be entitled to it or they have it by some kind of privilege. These are people that just decide, I'm going to get something, I'm going to have something, and I'm not going to let these uh, pre conceived ideas that people put in one another's heads about who can't and who won't and who shouldn't and who isn't. Instead, I'm going to make what I need to be and do what I need to do and learn what I must learn because this is where I'm going and I'm going to get there by the grace of God. So in the professional world, you have all these dynamics. Think what you want. Do what you want. But in God, there is no one that can qualify. None of us can go before God and say, look, I'm entitled to be saved. None of us can go to God and say, look, I'm righteous enough to go to heaven. I don't need salvation. I'm already good. I asked one man one time, said, you want to pray? He said, no, I'm good. He wasn't good. The Bible said there's none good, no, not one, that all are come short of the glory of God. All of us are without the righteousness that we need to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. So we are by grace. We are saved by the grant of God who said, just get in my son and you got an automatic scholarship. Get in my son and you have automatic privileges. Get in my son and you have everything that I want to give you, but you have to get in the son. And I'm so glad he didn't lay down a bunch of requirements. He just said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe on him that is risen from the dead and you shall be saved. Put your trust in the Lord and you shall be saved. And he'll give you his righteousness, his ability, his strength his standing, his position. You can be seated with him. You can walk with him. You can stand with him. And when Jesus was up in heaven, he saw that we were lost and on our way to hell. He got up off the throne and said, I'm going down there. He started moving and he came down here. He died for us and rose again. And now he's seated at the right hand of God ready to give you all power the last thing he said was stand you got to take a stand against sin you got to get up and say i believe the lord and i'm not going to live that way anymore yeah. hallelujah come on to the instruments so that's why he said in ephesians 6 put on the whole armor of god why that you might be able to stand against the trickery of the devil that you won't be taken by men and their philosophies and their words of enticement. That was back in the previous chapter, chapter 4. But here in chapter 6, it says, now stand. Don't be sucked in to the philosophies of this world and the wisdom of man. But stand against it and know and determine the truth by the word of the living God. He was seated on the throne and saw that we had a need. Something had to be done. So he condescended to our level, walked with God 30 plus years. He walked the earth. He walked to the cross. He ascended on high and sat back down where he came from. So what's the journey of the lost man? He must first walk to the cross. He must say, Lord, here I am. I want the old me to be crucified. Cause me to rise with Christ. Cause me to be in him and he in me. Because then I will have the perfect posture. I will be in the best possible position that a man or woman can be in seated with him, walking with him, standing with him against all the darkness of this world. How are you tonight? What's your position? What is your posture? Have you been standing or bowing to things you shouldn't bow to? Are you seated with him in that place of authority? Or are you falling down? Today, Position yourself, 
put yourself in the right posture with the help of God. Give him glory and praise. Amen and amen. Pastor Kinsey, your service. gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, and while on others thou art calling, do
Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Oh, pass me not, oh, blessed Savior. Such a classic song that we should know. Great man. Blessed prayers of the Bible right there. Put to music that we can sing from our heart. Go ahead and praise the God of heaven that saw us in our need, sent his son. And now we can know salvation and be happy and joyful because God, God has given us the revelation of Christ. Jesus, we praise you and we worship you. Oh, pass me not, oh, blessed Savior. And I'm thankful you didn't pass me by. And I am so thankful, Lord God, for all you've done. We can sit, we can walk, and we can stand because we love you. Amen. Praise God. God is good. God bless you. Let's have a wonderful week in the Lord. And let's just continue to serve in Bible study Tuesday night at 730. Be here, not here, over there. Fellowship Hall. And we'll just see where God lands us and who knows. But I'm praying about what new direction to go. And let's just come and have a wonderful time in the Lord. God bless you. Good night. We'll see you then.